as women, we are told that if a man approaches you and you aren't interested, all you have to do is reject him. Don't string him along. Don't be too nice. Don't lead him on because that will just make you look like a bitch. Excuse my language. But as women, we know that it isn't always as simple as it seems. Why? Because some men won't take no for an answer. Some men try to be persuasive or assertive. They think it's a game and you want to be chased. Sometimes it's a little bit annoying, but it's harmless. Other times, though, men will become obsessive or even violent if you reject them. Far too often, when a man is rejected, his ego is bruised and he blames the woman who said no, and he retaliates. And that is why some women can be afraid to reject men. This case is the perfect example of why so many women feel threatened when they reject someone they're not interested in. But before we get into this tragic case, I want to tell you all about a game that I love to play to relax and unwind. That game is Love and Pies. Love and Pies is the cutest free-to-play Merge 2 mobile game that you can play on your phone or tablet. Ever since I started playing months ago, I can't get enough. Love and Pies is the best game to play when I'm tired after a long day and I'm looking for something relaxing yet engaging and fun while cozying up in my house after work. Love and Pies revolves around the heartwarming story of taking over your mom's burnt down cafe. You play as a single mother, Amelia, who has to redecorate and build a thriving business by merging ingredients to make delicious pastries and serving them to your eager customers. There's also a little juicy storyline full of small town secrets and gossip with a hint of mystery and drama. I love games where you get to create and make your own designs while also keeping me engaged in gameplay, so that is why I love Love and Pies. I get to build my own cafe and design it all from the ground up. Plus, when you play, you will just be blown away by Love and Pies' stunning visuals and animations. They truly create an immersive experience that makes creating your own business that much more enjoyable. Enjoyable. There truly is something for everyone with Love and Pies, and I am so excited to hear how you all like the game. Now, Love and Pies wanted to do something special for viewers of this channel. Everyone that downloads Love and Pies within one week of this video using the link down below and then plays until day three will receive an amazing free gift via the in-game inbox message within seven days, so around next Tuesday since this video is going live on a Tuesday. You will get 200 energy and 300 gems, and once you start playing, you will see just how important those are in the game. So once again, use my link down below to download the game for free, and you will get your super sweet surprise gift delivered to your inbox. Thank you again so much to Love and Pies for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we will be discussing the case of Celeste Mano. Celeste Mano was born on November 22nd, 1996 to parents Aggie D. Morrow and Tony Mano, and she had an older brother named Jaden and a younger brother, Alessandro. At the time, Celeste was living with her mother and younger brother in the city of Mernda in Australia. Celeste was described as being the essence of love and kindness. She hated the idea of anyone being left out and always went out of her way to be inclusive and spread positivity to others. She was beautiful on the inside and out. She had the power to touch the lives of everyone who interacted with her, making it her mission to be kind and compassionate. Celeste was known to find joy in the simple pleasures in life. She loved music, dancing, and food, going out with friends, and living her life to its fullest. Throughout her life, her love for her family and friends was unwavering. After primary school, Celeste went on to university where she studied criminology and psychology, hoping to become a psychologist one day. She said that she wanted to learn as much about human nature as she could so she could be better at helping those who needed it most. For the time being, 23-year-old Celeste worked as a team leader at the Circle Call Center in Melbourne, Australia. There, she met her boyfriend at the time, Chris Risdale. The two had only been together a short amount of time before her death, but according to Chris, the time that they did spend together was amazing. 
he described that it was just effortless to love Celeste. They made each other laugh and would stay up late talking on the phone for hours, not wanting to hang up, so they'd always fall asleep on the phone together. Chris said that Celeste was just such a positive influence on everyone around her, and he knows that if he got to spend more time with her, they would have grown together and she would have made him a better person. Another man that Celeste worked with at the call center was 36-year-old Louis Nader Sacco, who was originally from Iraq and migrated to Australia with his parents and four siblings in 1992. He started working at the call center in 2018 as a customer service operator. However, he was known to be very recluse and introverted and honestly, he wasn't great at his job. So, by June of 2019, a year after starting, he was fired from his position. During the year of him working under Celeste, again, Celeste was the team leader, the two never really interacted much. They weren't friends, they weren't close by any means, but given that Celeste was kind and caring, on the day Loe was fired, she offered him support and escorted him out to his car, being professional and polite. But it seems that Loe totally misread Celeste's kindness, and when she extended a hand out to him to wish him the best, he thanked her for her compassion and kindness and kissed her on the cheek. At that time, she told Loe that she was not interested in him like that. Later that evening, she went home and told her mother and brother how embarrassed she felt and how uncomfortable the whole situation made her. But him no longer working with Celeste did not stop Louie from contacting her and trying to get her attention by any means necessary. About a week after that interaction happened with Loe kissing Celeste on the cheek against her will, he found Celeste's social media accounts and direct messaged her. He thanked her again for her kindness, but this time he declared his love and affection for her. Once again, she replies politely, saying that her feelings for him are strictly professional. She doesn't invite any further contact. The messages are as follows. Loy says, I'm sorry, but I can't stop thinking about you. I've never felt this way about anyone in my entire life. It's bordering along OCD. I'm totally infatuated with you, captivated and fascinated by you. You're all I think about. But after leaving you, my productivity in my personal life and my new job is being impacted. This obsession with you, which is a crush, is an addictive and destructive feeling that's interfering with my ability to concentrate, deal with others, and go about my daily routine. To put in end to my suffering, can you be direct with me and just tell me how you feel towards me? Candidness is one of the traits I value most in people. Celeste, hi Loe, those are really sweet words and I appreciate you saying all of that to me. I'm a bit surprised to read this as it is all new to me. As much as I appreciate this, I only feel a professional way towards you and I wish you all the best towards your new job and journey. Loe, I appreciate your response and honesty. If it was ever possible, I'd give my life and the world to you just to be with you. I hope that one day I'll meet another Celeste for who I can do just that and for which can be my son that shines. After this interaction, he continues to send her messages. In another message, Celeste is more clear and upfront with what she wants. She asks him to stop contacting her, and these messages read as quote, Loe, I'm so infatuated with you that now it's becoming unhealthy. I know my words don't help me. Maybe some NLP would help. I'm sorry for coming on strong, Celeste. I'm just another rival for your affection. Celeste, I just saw these messages request by pure chance as I don't check the message requests often and I was quite shocked after reading them all. I would really appreciate if you could stop contacting me as this is making me very uncomfortable. Please respect my wishes and stop contacting me, Loe. Loe, my impression of you has changed. You're no different to the majority of women. I'll remember you and this lesson for all of life and I will devote every ounce of energy I have to climbing up and proving to the world that I'm somebody. This is my promise to you and final contact with you. But as you can imagine, that was not his last contact with her. After asking him to stop contacting her, she did block him, but that did not stop him. He started making other fake accounts and would send her message after message. He would send her a barrage of messages and then would just stop contacting her for days or weeks at a time, but no matter what she said or did, the messages continued. At one point, Celeste got her mother involved because she was so disturbed by these messages and his utter lack of respect he showed her. These messages read, Louis, enjoy the rest of your day. 
Celeste. This is Celeste's mother as well as Celeste. You were told to stop contacting her back in February. Since then, you have made another account and started this again. Celeste is deleting and blocking you again. Don't make another account to contact her anymore. We will be in contact with the police again. To this, Loe responded, There's absolutely no reason to feel intimidated by me, Celeste. Would you please say something? You're having to rethink your responses, Celeste. Please speak your mind. Celeste, I want you to stop contacting me. I involved my mother because she can see how angry I am to you ignoring what I want. For the last time, stop contacting me. I'm blocking this account. After months and months of messaging her, by December of 2019, the messages turned from professing his love and affection to getting more sexual in nature. He started describing in extremely graphic and vulgar detail sexual things that he wanted to do with and to her. Her family said that some of the messages he wrote are so graphic that they didn't feel comfortable sharing them. But one of the messages reads, Have you ever had a beast pounce on you, Celeste? I would pounce on you like a pit bull. Obviously, Aggie was very concerned at these messages and how the situation was progressing. She knew that they were dealing with a very scary, unstable man who clearly had no regard for what Celeste or anyone else wanted. Celeste was worried that he could be following her. He knew where she worked, so it wouldn't be a stretch to say that he could follow her home and find out where she lived. There was even one time where she saw Louie parked outside of her work and it seemed like he was just waiting for her. Because of this, Celeste started putting certain safety measures in place to make sure that someone was always with her or at least always knew where she was. So she shared her location with her mother. She also expressed her fears to her boss saying, he's really going to kill me. At that point, she started having her boss walk her to her car every night after a shift at work. At that point, she didn't know what else she could do. But after these messages continued and got more and more concerning, Celeste and Aggie decided that it would be best if they got law enforcement involved. By early 2020, they headed to the Myrnta police station to report the stalking, but at this time, their concerns were not taken seriously. The officer they reported the incident to barely even read the messages they showed him and didn't even log the visit. All the officer said was that there wasn't a crime committed, so they couldn't do anything. They said to block him and consider getting off social media. Which again, we know she did block him and his multiple other accounts, but all he did was just find new ways of contacting her. So we know that no matter what she did at that point, this wasn't going to stop. But by July 1st of 2020, after the messages continued to escalate, they returned to the police station once again. This time, they had a manila envelope prepared of printouts of all of the messages that Louie had been sending her over the past year. And finally, officers took the situation more seriously. By the following day, Celeste was granted a personal safety intervention order, or a PSIO, against Loe. A PSIO is essentially a restraining order that aims to protect a person from the physical or mental harm caused by someone else. By July 8th, a copy of the order was served to Loe, who was told to stop contacting Celeste. They attended a court hearing that following month, where Loe was ordered to cease all contact with Celeste. Around the same time, he was taken into the police station and questioned about the messages, and he basically said that sending her daily messages was therapeutic for him, that he didn't think his conduct was in any way illegal. He said that if Celeste found these messages distressing, that she just shouldn't have read them. He denied sending vulgar or sexually explicit messages, he also said that he has no further interest in Celeste, he doesn't want a relationship with her, and he doesn't want anything to do with her. But once again, his behaviors did not stop. He continued to send her messages from fake accounts, and within six weeks of receiving that order, Loe sent Celeste a message on Instagram which said, Celeste, my statement in PDF. He had sent over a link to a Google Drive which contained a lengthy letter asking her to withdraw her order. He said that he isn't a threat to her. He isn't a criminal. He said that he isn't even interested in her anymore, so she has nothing to worry about. The letter reads as follows. Celeste, there are people who are in real threat and who need protection. The law and legal system can help them and it's good that we have that in place. 
but it also goes after unsuspecting offenders and deliberately turns them into criminals. It's a bad system and needs oversight to protect people like me who are suddenly made into criminals. I'm not a criminal, never in my life thought that I would be made into one, but that's how things are playing out. It's killing me inside and tearing me apart. Depression is sinking in and I'm feeling absolute despair. I feel that life isn't worth living. I'm writing this to you to help me, to help you, to help us, Celeste. The legal system, law enforcement, although it's good we have it, it cannot be trusted every time. I don't mean to cause you any discomfort if you're feeling it now. I sincerely hope you're feeling calm, warm, and in peace. Just how you should be. Just how we should be. Only you can end this now, Celeste. Please end this nonsense by withdrawing the order and stopping the charges against me for stalking and harassment. I want to live my life happily with my family and my future family just as much as you do. This is my final communication and interaction with you. I have zero interest in you and I don't want any more involvement with you if you want me to provide statements to back my claims through legal. Celeste, I beg for you to please end this. This is absolutely unnecessary. You didn't need to go down this path to try and stop me messaging you. For God's sake, Celeste, it was just Instagram DMs. They weren't threatening messages. They could have been messages from a guy in India saying, I love you while eating dinner, riding his moped. You needn't have left any worries. Celeste, you were initially, initially the focus of my attention. Why? Because I fell in love with you. But my love dissipated over time. I know there are 3 billion other women out there in the world, Celeste. You're beautiful but so are so many other women. After receiving this letter, both Celeste and Aggie read it, and of course, this terrified them. They were afraid of retaliation from Loe. They didn't know what to expect, but they knew that he was capable of anything. He clearly was not self-aware in the slightest, thinking that his obsession and harassment and messaging were not only not his fault, but he blamed Celeste for being disturbed by them. He took no accountability for his actions and blamed everyone but himself. He blamed her for reading the messages even when she knew they would disturb her. It was her fault for reading them, not his for sending them. So they brought this letter to the police and asked if they should withdraw the intervention order. But police insisted that they keep it in place. They felt that having an order like this would be a better safeguard to prevent Loay from harassing Celeste further. It made it so that there was a step, like if Loay was even in her presence, they could report him for it, whereas if they didn't have this protection order, he could be around her and they couldn't really say much. After finding out about the letter Loay sent to Celeste, police did take him into the station for another interview. There, he said that the COVID-19 pandemic was causing him to become isolated and lonely, saying that his mental health was declining. So, he admitted to sending those messages to her, but he said that he's not a threat. He said that Celeste lied in her protection order application and that he presents no harm to her. But by the following month, he was charged with violating a protection order as well as with using a carriage service to harass and he was scheduled to attend a court hearing in February of 2021. And it seems that after this letter, maybe things were finally over. Weeks passed without any contact from Louis. It seemed like he was disappearing from their lives, finally accepting reality that his obsession is not Celeste's problem. In the meantime, Celeste was enjoying the start of her new relationship with Chris. On November 15th, 2020, she finally decided to officially announce her new relationship by posting a picture of the two of them at a pub together, which was taken that previous day. However, neither she nor Chris or anyone else in her family could have predicted the devastating consequences of posting that innocent photo. By around 3.55 a.m. on the morning of November 16th, 2020, Aggie was awoken to the sound of glass shattering within her home. Immediately, Aggie is concerned for her daughter's safety, so she rushed to Celeste's bedroom to check on her, and it was at that time where she found 23-year-old Celeste lying in her bed, unresponsive, covered in blood, with a bloody knife lying on the bed near her foot. Immediately, Aggie called 911 and attempted CPR to save her daughter's life, but unfortunately, 
it wasn't enough. It turned out that Celeste had been stabbed a total of 23 times to her chest, abdomen, back, legs, and head. She was also found to have defensive wounds on her arms. According to later autopsy, it was a stab wound to her heart that ultimately killed her. Right away, Aggie knew exactly who was responsible for this horrific, tragic murder, but it took absolutely no time for police to find that person and bring them in. Upon reviewing CCTV footage, as well as using cell phone evidence to track Loay's movements, investigators found that all the way back in August, Loay purchased a kitchen knife that he would later use for the attack. At 3.22 a.m. on the 16th, Loay Sacco left his home in Ruxburg Park and drove the 20 minutes over to the home where Celeste lived with her mother and younger brother. Upon arriving, he circled the block several times before parking in front of her house at 3.48 a.m. After Loay parked his car and immediately got out, he scaled the fence that surrounded the home and made entry into the backyard. He then found Celeste's bedroom window, smashing the glass with a hammer to make entry. Within about two minutes, he manages to stab Celeste 23 times before running out of the room and sprinting back to his car. According to the CCTV footage on the street they lived in, Loay was only out of his car for a total of 2 minutes and 39 seconds. Immediately after the attack, Loay drove himself to the Mernda police station, still covered in blood from the attack. As he is about to enter the station, he is stopped by two police officers. He mentions Celeste and gives them her address and says to them, you know what happened, it's your fault. Of course, Loay was immediately apprehended and taken into police custody while police responded to the scene of where Celeste was brutally murdered. In his first interview with police, Loay showed absolutely no remorse. In fact, he pushed the blame off of himself and instead blamed everyone around him. He complained of the unfair and unjust treatment of him by Celeste and how she treated him like a criminal, how police treated him like a criminal. He admitted to driving past her house and entering the bedroom, but he said that when he went inside, he had an altercation with someone, but wasn't sure who, because the room was too dark for him to see, acting as if he had no idea that it was Celeste and that he wasn't actually targeting her. After the initial interview, police started their investigation into what happened in the hours and days leading to the murder, and what they found made the whole situation just that much more disturbing. After being taken into custody, Loay was examined by forensic psychiatrists, and I will get more into that in just a minute. But like I mentioned earlier, after sending that letter to Celeste asking her to drop the charges, the messages to her stopped. Celeste and Aggie were relieved and thought that the whole thing was over. However, Loay would later tell psychiatrists that during that time, he was actually researching how he would murder Celeste. During that period of silence, Loay was busy researching any and all photos Celeste posted to social media to find out her address. He used Google Maps and eventually found her home. He then found the floor plan to her home and used that to figure out where her bedroom was located. After that, he then drove past the house multiple times on multiple different occasions to get a better idea of the layout. He was seething with rage against Celeste for the order of protection while still having that disturbing infatuation with her. Police also conducted a line search along the road in front of Celeste's home, and in that search, they found Loay's phone, which was still soaked in blood. Upon examining the phone, they found an Instagram account logged into an account with the name of Farah Atelia with a profile photo of a young woman. This was a fake account that Loay made to follow Celeste, but obviously she didn't realize that it was him, so she approved the follow request. On his phone, they also found contact information for Celeste's brothers. It had a collection of 23 photos of Celeste, including a screenshot of the last photo she posted of herself and Chris. When police went into Loay's home to investigate there, they found his MacBook, which contained two photos of Celeste's boyfriend, Chris. 
They also found Google searches for Chris and found that LeWay had visited a link that took him to Chris's LinkedIn account. They also found that he accessed a website for the Provincial Hotel, which is where Celeste and Chris were in in that photo that she posted of the two of them. I believe she was in a pub located within that hotel. And obviously, Loey figured that out. In his room, investigators also found a white envelope which contained written notes about the intervention order of protection as well as the court proceedings and charges. In one of the notes, he wrote, quote, She is telling lies just to add weight to her case so as to get me into trouble and stop me from messaging her. The allegation of sexual texts are false. She meant nothing but trouble for me. The allegations are downright false. Her beauty is manipulated. She has an inflated sense of worth. She needs protection from whatever she has conjured up through her overly sensitive mind. Clearly, Loewe is a very disturbed man who thinks very highly of himself and very low of everyone around him. He thinks that Celeste is the problem. Not him for incessantly messaging her, but it's her fault for reading the messages and reacting accordingly. After being taken into police custody, like I said, as he awaited his trial, he was examined by multiple forensic psychiatrists. His goal at first was to get the doctors to diagnose him with a severe mental impairment that would deem him unfit to stand trial. He started telling one of them, Dr. Rajan Darji, about how he was experiencing visual hallucinations. Specifically, he saw a figure that he called Isha who he described as ugly with big ears, a big nose, and pointy teeth. He said that the figure told him to be a criminal and was even in the car with him while he was driving to Celeste's and it told him to end things. But based on other things that Louis told Dr. Darji in that interview, he did not buy that he was experiencing a psychosis or anything of the sort. According to what he would later testify at his plea hearing, he believes that Louis was making up this hallucination to garner sympathy and make himself less culpable for his actions. He said, though, that he believed this hallucination represented Louis trying to understand and describe the other ugly side of himself that he didn't understand. He went on to say, quote, I think it's really his way of kind of explaining what's going on in different parts of himself, a part of him that absolutely hated the victim, but he won't be able to incorporate that with a part of him that was in love with the victim. He tried to portray that as if it's a psychotic experience and I didn't think it was. He goes on to say, he was exaggerating. He was trying to persuade me that he had a mental impairment defense because he wanted to get sympathy and didn't want to be seen as being a monster. He said that LeWay was using words that were very similar to the exact diagnostic criteria they would use to diagnose psychotic disorder, meaning that LeWay had extensive knowledge of psychosis and he tried to use that to get himself diagnosed. He said that he has never assessed someone with that level of knowledge and understanding of the criteria or who had used direct wording of a defense of mental impairment. After his intensive examination of LeWay, Dr. Jean wrote a 125-page long report, which is the longest he had ever written. In the report, he diagnosed Louis with an extreme personality disorder, depressive disorder, and body dysmorphia. He said that Louis felt increasingly persecuted by police and Celeste after that intervention order was taken out against him and when he was charged with breaching the order. Then, Celeste posting that photo of herself and another man is really what broke the camel's back. His obsession and rage amplified, and he couldn't handle the fact that Celeste was out there happily living her life with someone else, all the while she was persecuting him for his innocent messages. Dr. Rajan said that in terms of the murder, he was enraged with Celeste while also desperate for the situation to disappear. After being examined by multiple psychiatrists, Louis Sacco was found competent to stand trial. At his initial plea hearing, the court heard from multiple psychiatrists who testified to everything I just told you. The family was also at these hearings and they also had to hear Louis continue to deflect all blame away from himself and towards everyone else. They had to hear the medical examiner describe all of her injuries, saying that the first wound she suffered was the fatal one to the heart and what the judge called disturbing efficiency. 
all other wounds were just overkill. For the three years that followed the murder, Luay changed his defense team numerous times, changed his plea, and refused to show up to certain court hearings. He contested multiple different facts in the case, which really were just small aspects to the case and had no bearing in his guilt. One of the facts he tried contesting was how many times he stabbed Celeste, which as I stated, didn't really matter. The first one was to her heart and it killed her, so the number of stab wounds does not matter. That is just one example, but it shows that he was trying to do whatever he could to delay all of this. All of these different tactics caused the trial to be delayed until January of 2024, where ultimately, Louis did end up pleading guilty to the charge of murder. At his sentencing hearing, his defense team asked that his mental illness be considered, saying that he has a potential for rehabilitation. Meanwhile, the prosecution was asking for a life sentence, saying that this was the absolute worst way he could have murdered her. She lived her life in constant fear and torment for a year before ultimately her life was taken from her. In the end, Justice Jane Dixon sentenced Louis Sacco to 36 years in jail with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Of course, Celeste's family are happy that their beautiful Celeste's case has justice, but are furious at the sentence Louis got. They are upset that he avoided a life sentence and spoke about how the government and law enforcement not only allowed him to get a lighter sentence, but it was their fault that Celeste was murdered to begin with. They failed to take the stalking seriously. And now, because of that, their daughter is dead. Aggie DeMauro prepared a statement hoping for the best. But she says the system has let her down. It's outrageous. Absolutely unbelievable. That the court decided to grant him mercy, even though he showed Celeste none. She wanted her daughter's killer, Louise Seiko, jailed for life. Instead, Justice Dixon delivered this sentence. Louise Seiko, I sentence you to 36 years imprisonment. I fix a non-parole period of 30 years. Celeste Mano was killed in a jealous rage fueled by unrequited love. The 23-year-old's cause of death, a stab wound to the heart. Clearly, I'm devastated. We all are. Aggie had awoken to the sound of breaking glass and had gone to check on her daughter. She found Celeste lying on the bed covered in blood. I want the beast that took my daughter away from me to know and have no doubt whatsoever that he is safer inside. In the aftermath of this horrific and brutal murder, Celeste's family has called for a change to the laws with how stalking is handled. They said that police often don't take victims seriously and any time they are listened to, they are given the option of an order of protection. But with so many of these protection orders being given out, it is impossible to identify the high-risk cases that need more special attention. Statistics show that in the 10 years from 2011 to 2020, there were over 100,000 applications for personal safety intervention orders and almost 26,000 breaches were recorded by police. In that same period, police recorded 25,130 stalking offenses. And even when these high-risk cases are reported, not much is done, as you can see. Aggie ended up filing a civil claim against the Victoria Police, saying that they didn't properly conduct a risk assessment relating to the threat which led to her death. That breached their duty of care. As of right now, the case is undergoing evaluation by the Screening Assessment for Stalking and Harassment, also known as SASH. This particular part of the case is still ongoing, but Aggie said that she just hopes that she can enact change for other victims who are suffering from the same harassment as Celeste and hopes to prevent these types of crimes from continuing. I think for Celeste's case, in my opinion, it was nice to see some action being taken by police. They did talk to him, they did charge him with breaching the order, but I do think they should have seen the red flags. The fact that he continued to take no accountability and saw absolutely nothing with his actions going as far as blaming Celeste, that should have set off alarm bells for police. If someone is told what you are doing is wrong, but they truly don't believe that they're doing anything wrong, they won't stop the behavior because they don't think they need to. 
They just think that everyone around them is out to get them and that is why they're being told that their actions are wrong. So as soon as he started blaming everybody else and trying to downplay his clearly obsessive actions, I think something more should have been done. But that is the tricky part of this case because I don't know what the answer should be. I obviously don't know what I think could have or should have been done. Obviously, we can all hope that police can identify these people and assess them as threatening and try to get charges against them, but even if you get charges against them, you can't lock someone up for sending harassing messages. You just can't. And while that is unfortunate, I do think there should be harsher punishments for breaching orders and harassing someone after it's been made clear that they need to stop. Because clearly, these protection orders and the fear of consequences were not enough to stop the way. In fact, they just made him more angry. I think once police saw these red flags, they should have maybe had him assessed for his mental stability and maybe at that point they could have had him committed or just something to really just figure out what's going on and figure out an actual way to stop it after seeing that Louie clearly was breaching the orders and clearly was not stopping anytime soon. My heart absolutely breaks for Celeste, her family, her new boyfriend, and everyone else who loved her. I can't imagine what it must have been like to go through something so horrific. Aggie has said that she struggles every single day with questioning why she couldn't protect her daughter, why she couldn't prevent this from happening. She blames herself, and while we all know that she isn't to blame at all, and honestly, I don't think she could have done anything to prevent this, I understand why she feels the way she does. And nothing anyone says will heal the gaping wounds that Celeste's murder have left in those who loved her. I am happy that Louis is behind bars, but I'm also frustrated that he was able to exhibit such a horrifying lack of remorse and still be considered for parole. I hope that he's never released. It's really sickening to know that he could be in his 60s and just released to be out in the public and do this to another person. I truly hope he stays behind bars for the rest of his life where he belongs. But that is all of the information that I have on today's video, and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that police could have done anything to prevent this? If so, what? What do you think of Louis' obsessive behaviors and his complete disregard for his own actions? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!